Hello all 490 of you fellow poker junkies. Welcome to another episode of Potato Poker. I'm gonna pause really quick before we get into this video and just say that it's pretty exciting to almost be at 500 subs. And to celebrate that, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give 50 bucks to two different Patreon supporters and I'm going to do that at the beginning of the next video. So whenever we reach 500, the following video, I will announce our winners and I will send you $50 each. Hope you're excited about that. Let's get into this video. Thank you for supporting the channel. Let's go. As poker players, we tend to desire a few things. Profit, results, and the approval of others at our skill set. I guess on some level, we tend to be a little bit vain subconsciously. However, focusing on what other people think of our game tends to rob us of the profit and results that we desire. In his book on exploitative play, Alex Fitzgerald points out that most people you're sitting with at a poker table lose money on average by playing cards. It's a hobby for them and a way to have fun, but they're usually not winning players. If we seek their approval, we'll tend to be a losing player as well. Instead, this episode, let's talk about what it takes to think like a pro and to win like a pro instead of thinking like everyone else at the table. We're going to talk about a hand that's uncomfortable to illustrate this point, but first, as we always do, let's grab our cup of coffee from the book. All right, coffee for this one is a mocha mint cooler. Sounds disgusting to me. Mint and coffee do not seem to go together, but let's try it out. We'll see how it is. All right, these are mint leaves from a plant that my dad allowed us to grab from his place. And while we're back here, I will introduce you to our newest employees. Meet our chickens, the kids name them. So the gray one is Eeyore. And we have Minerva Louise. And Hot Chocolate is the brown one, or HC. And then this one up here is Marshmallow. <laughs> we uh, turn them loose in the garden and they do all kinds of gardening for us. All right, mint coffee. Give it a go. It's weird. <laughs> I would never choose to make this again, so two out of five. All right, with that, let's get back to the poker. Last week, I released an episode that included the falling hand, and I wanna say a huge thanks to Michael who asked me a difficult question. For this week's episode, we're taking a look at a hand that I played in the most recent vlog, uh, the 1-3 session from the win in Vegas day four. If you wanna check out that session, I will link it in the description below so that you can give that a watch. We joined this hand a little bit late, but we're holding ace-king offsuit in the big blind to make it $70 over a raise to 20 from the button. The button re-raises to 145. This is a, basically a min-raise, and I'm going to call and see if we can hit a flop because of the price, but I will say that most opponents are not going to four bet at these stakes, so I think you could actually exploitatively fold here. I think best case scenario, you have the same hand or you're flipping. Worst case scenario, you're absolutely dominated and crushed, and because people don't four bet very often, we're probably more likely to be crushed than anything else. And so I know it's a min raise, and I know we already have 70 in there. We're getting insane odds. I almost think it's a fold at these stakes. I think at higher stakes, for sure, I'm calling. The price is so good. I end up making the call. The flop comes down 10 7 7. It's an interesting spot where we could consider a donk lead. But I think that I would only be willing to make a play like this at higher stakes where players have more variety in their range. This comment came from Michael. Michael, thanks for your question. And I, uh, I, got a good <laughs> I got a good laugh reading your comment here. So let's read it. The hand you raise, ace king over a button open. What are effective stacks pre? I apologize, I did not put that in there. They were 500 effective. Also, you said in a bigger game, you always flat his four bet. Now, I don't know that I would always flat a four bet here, but what I am trying to say is that the price, when we're getting three to one and we have 43% equity against his range, assuming that his range includes jacks or better, ace king off, and ace queen suited plus, we're gonna go ahead and be able to flat this four bet pretty easily. I love this comment here, not trying to be a dick, but was that serious? Yeah, it was serious, but I wanted to clarify what I meant by that. I guess I didn't put a lot of the clarification into the video and into the commentary, and so I thought this is a good chance to kind of break this down. We have plenty of equity to make a call if our opponent is doing this wide enough. Now, I stated at a game like 1-3 that this is probably an exploitable spot to just fold ace-king. You don't have to make the fold. The price is really good. You can just make the call. 
but most opponents at 1-3 are doing this with aces, kings, and maybe ace, king. Now when you step up in stakes and you start playing more challenging opponents, you're going to find that they'll start to widen their 4-bet range. This spot gets really unique because both players' ranges are actually really, really similar. And if anything, the player who is taking the aggressive action as the 4-better will almost have a weaker range than the player who is making the call. And that, that, again, that's going to depend on your player type, but if your player is going to be willing to bet like an ace-5 suited, that's not ever going to be in a 4-bet calling range. But basically, they're going to be almost identical. So what I did is I put this together with what the effective stacks were. The effective stacks, 500. The pot starting out is $290. And so the starting stack is essentially about $350 here. So we get to the flop and I'm out of position. And you'll see that the solver here is going to have us jamming with about 50% of our range. Now aces, kings, queens, and it starts to thin out as you get into jacks and tens. But ace-king offsuit is jamming at a pretty high frequency. And when you look down at my specific combination with the ace of hearts, you'll see that it's about 50% of the time that it's going to be jamming for $350 with the ace of hearts, king of diamonds. So this is a spot that I like putting max pressure on an opponent. And the reason is, so we make this bet of $350, and look at what the opponent is going to do in response. They're going to be, like I said on the video, folding out for the most part their uh, Broadway hands. Now if they have hearts, you'll see that hearts are calling in both scenarios, but we hold the ace of hearts. So we're eliminating that calling portion of this range right here. So it's showing this calling at a decent frequency about a quarter of the time, but that's not going to happen because we block the ace of hearts. So for that reason, they're folding these, and even when you get down here, you can see with their ace-king offsuit combos, again, what are they calling with? Mostly the ace of hearts. We hold that in our hand. So basically, they're folding all of their unpaired Broadway hands, their ace-five if they hold it, and occasionally they're gonna fold some jacks. So we're actually gonna fold out a decent amount of their range. We're gonna get some calls from aces, kings, queens, and jacks, we're gonna be crushed in this scenario. We're going to have some outs in this scenario and we're gonna take this one down. So about 40% of the time, they're gonna be folding here. So you can see that right here. Now, if you're holding jacks in this scenario and you are the player who has made the four bet pre, this is probably a board where you're gonna get it all in, but it feels disgusting if you go, <laughs> if you go four bet, the flop comes out and your opponent jams into you do you really feel good with jacks here? I mean, you probably feel uh, okay, but I think it's a pretty miserable spot actually when you get called by a four bet and then there's a jam and you have jacks. Like what are they jamming with? If they have tens, it's a set. If they have any over pair, then they've got you beat. So really it needs to be a bluff and people are gonna under bluff this spot. It's a spot that I'm not gonna make this play very often. It's gonna be a super low frequency play. But when you think about the fact that when you have ace king, you're reducing the combinations of aces and kings. And you can see here, if we make this jam with ace king offsuit, it's actually profitable. Consider plays even if they sound weird. And guys, thanks for your comments and feedback. Continue to challenge me. Thanks for watching. If this video stretched your brain at all, give it a like and a sub. Appreciate you watching. Go crush a table and I will talk to you next time.